On today's episode, I'm joined by project engineers Ryan Damon and Miles Neville. We're talking all things design and application of sub X bullets and subsonic ammunition. Now, for quite some time, the popularity of subsonic shooting has been continuing to climb, and we offer a bullet and a line of ammunition specifically designed for terminal performance at reduced velocities. We hope you enjoy it. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik. Thanks for joining us today. We've got a really great episode, one that I'm excited about. It's a really cool product that we pioneered here, and I'm joined on the podcast today with a couple of guys that helped pioneer this project completely off the ground. So join me in welcoming project managers and mechanical engineers and bullet engineers and all kinds of cool other titles, Ryan Damon and Miles Neville. Guys, thanks for coming on. Howdy. Good to be here. Yeah, you guys, you do wear a lot of hats. Our engineering department historically has hit absolute home runs as far as new product development goes for the last long time. And you guys uh, do a great job, but there's not a lot of you. I feel like in relation to the other people in the industry, like we run very lean and uh, yeah, you guys manage a lot of different things, but the research and development aspect is one thing that I think our company does really well because you guys are obviously smart guys. You're passionate about what you're doing and they pretty well just seems like they turn you loose. Is that kind of how it goes? Yeah. Yeah. We got, I mean, we got a decent group of engineers now, but as far as bullet plan and new products go, there's only a a handful of us that really work on that directly. And yeah, it's pretty nice that we just kind of get set free and figure out new stuff. Full, full artistic freedom. Full artistic freedom. That's that's fantastic. So uh, I don't think a lot of people really understand what goes into making a bullet. And that's probably a, a podcast in and of itself is taking raw copper, raw lead, and just taking soft metal and hammering the heck out of it with hard metal and making it into an absolutely perfect shape that flies true and shoots really accurately. I mean, that in and of itself is is, yeah, a couple hour discussion. So needless to say, it's a long process. So on the research and development side, it's just that much longer because you're trying to control things and the mechanism that controls the thing might not be clearly defined. Or if you turn one knob, it also turns several others down the line. And so within the, the draw process of making a bullet, um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong and a lot of things that can go right. And the research and development side of things We've really got a good job. I say we collectively, not like I have anything to do with it, but uh, have a good handle on what knobs to turn to control uh, what we're trying to control, whether that be terminal performance or in-flight characteristics or or what have you. We can manipulate things, and you guys do a great job at that. And the reason I brought you up here is because I want to talk about all things Sub X. Um, Sub X is a bullet that is featured in our subsonic line of ammunition. And it is now available as a reloading component in all calibers that we offer. And it is purposefully designed to operate terminally at reduced velocity and at subsonic velocity. And that sounds pretty easy at the top level. But uh, having had my hand in, in some of the testing of these bullets, not always the easiest nut to crack. So before we get into uh, the lines of ammunition, we have to focus on the bullet. And Ryan, you've been here a long time. You've had your hand in some absolute, I said it earlier, home run products, ELD Match, ELDX, A-Tip. I mean, some some big ones, products that literally keep the lights on around here. And you were right there at ground level for the Sub-X. So let's rewind until whenever this started. And what precipitated us to even look into subsonic expansion? What was going on? Well, there's a lot of LE applications for a 30 cal bullet that could run in a 300 blackout at subsonic velocities that would expand, not just expand, but expand be, well, expand well, expand in a controlled manner and through barriers. Okay. So law enforcement. So we're talking FBI protocol for penetration. Yep. Okay. Yep. So the early on it was, can we even get a bullet to function and expand? And at the beginning is how heavy is it going to be? How long, uh, 
how thick? Thick jacket, thin jacket. I mean, what are, how is the bullet even going to be constructed? At the time, that was just a big question. So early on, we were drilling out tips on uh, some spar point round noses, 220 oh. round noses. 30 cal, 220 30 round cal. nose. Looks like my pinky finger is Drilling them out on a lathe bullet. and just putting in a existing tips that we already had the soft rubber tips and mm -hmm. seeing what they would do and that showed yeah okay that's going to expand it does something anyway and gelatin so yeah and that was kind of the, the ground floor there is okay yeah it can work and we just need to refine fine tune it. it a lot yeah and what year was this this was probably mid 2016 and early 2017 okay. and i feel like that was when 300 blackout you know, it'd been around for a lot longer than that, but the 2016 time frame, I feel like, is really when that cartridge took off and got a strong hold in the military and law enforcement type applications. Commercially, obviously, it was successful, but people were seeing this as a viable option now. So you set out to not just make a bullet expand, but you guys were trying to make it expand through the FBI protocol for penetration, which is not an easy set of, of problems to solve. Um, cause there's, there's a lot of dynamic barriers going on there. Obviously shoot it into bear jail and you shoot it through heavy clothing and then wall board and then the car door scenario and the, the glass and sheet metal. It's really, uh, a, a tough set of, of barriers to penetrate and expand and to do it consistently across all six barriers. Cause it's, it's relatively easy to make a bullet perform in some of them. Yeah. But all of them is tough. So you started with an old, a classic 30 cal, 220 grain round nose that we've been making for like five or six decades. And that's probably a good place to start though, because that works in a 300 blackout at subsonic. I, you know, talking to reloaders, people have been loading that subsonically for, for a long time. Uh, cause you can get it below the speed of sound. It takes up mm -hmm. a bunch of case capacity and, uh, yeah, that, that works. So you put them on a lathe, you drill the tip out. And then you plug in just an existing critical duty or critical defense tip. And if that doesn't speak to our uh, artistic freedom, <laughs> I don't know what does, because that's not a very, um, you know, super refined way of testing. But it, we'll show you and I'll kind of, does it pass the sniff test? Yeah. That's how a lot of things go. I mean, you're just playing around, basically. Mm -hmm. Just, oh, I wonder what happens if you do this. You know, can you get, just get, break over the edge to say, oh yeah, that, that does something. And then from there you, you take it and roll with it and fully develop it. Okay. So like you said, Miles, does this do something? Yes. Yes, it does do something. So that was late 2016. What are we doing in 2017 now to refine that? How'd that process go? So initially we're narrowing down bullet weight. We're talking about that initial 30 cal, what ended up being a 190. I think we started at two, maybe just do it two, start at 225 and 210. And our problem was we were getting great expansion in bare gel, but you'd over penetrate. Mm. You got so much mass there, you'd over penetrate. And so, okay, we can tweak down the bullet weight. Then there's just trade offs there for you got to get the right amount of penetration, not over penetration. We ended up at 190. Then you start getting bare gel. Okay, you now you start doing your barriers and just a constant trade off of features with the bullet. Uh, the jacket serrations end up coming into play and how we form those jacket serrations based on every other process that we had to put into that bullet construction. This actually was an, a new tool design that we use in bullet construction was born in this throughout this process, which we use a lot now. Really? Yeah, a, different, a new type of a die and how we form those serrations on that jacket. Okay, and the serrations just kind of uh, structurally weaken the jacket at very specific places. Right. Okay. Because at this time we had, I mean, you gotta remember we were doing the critical duty pistol bullets for several years at this point. So we knew what kind of needed to happen for a bullet to expand through all these barriers. Mm -hmm. Then scaling that down to a 30 cal and a rifle cartridge that brought up other things that we didn't really anticipate. So yeah, we knew, okay, we, jacket's got to be serrated so that at such a slow velocity, that's going to open up and do what you need to do. You need to get so much frontal area so you don't overexpand, but you need to do that through plywood and drywall and glass and sheet metal. So all those things, you got to figure out where the lead's got to be, how deep the cavity is underneath the tip, how far the lead is up towards the top of mm -hmm. the jacket, all these things uh, 
took some time, took a few months there to yeah. get those narrowed in before we could actually even run production. So from a bullet construction standpoint, what features does this bullet have? So we've got a serrated jacket up front, uh, a big uh, frontal area with a big polymer tip, and then down from there, uh, cantilever interlock. What, what are we looking at from a construction side? Uh, cantilever and an, yep, cantilever and an interlock. Uh, the cantilever, at the cantilever and the interlock locations um, help us shear, mm-hmm. shear through glass. The bullet hitting glass, that's just the toughest thing for a, a jacketed bullet to withstand. Yep. That automobile windshield glass just wreaks havoc on a bullet. So yeah. if we can control that loss of mass up in the front end of the bullet and get the appropriate ma- appropriate penetra- penetration, those features help us do that. The interlock's got to help hold the core through all, all barriers. Big cavity underneath the tip helps us create that surface area mm-hmm. flowing, expanding on the front end. And a uh, relatively thin jacket up front because you just got to have that ex- yeah. it's weakness open to up. open up. Okay, and so when you say shear through glass, this is, this is hard to describe without physically seeing it, but yeah. the glass barrier for the FBI is a compound angle. It's 45 degrees and I think laid back at 15 degrees. Right. So. And so a bullet, when it strikes it, what we want our sub-X to do and what we do with our critical duty is the part that strikes the glass and expands, we want that part that does that, the part of that bullet, to then break off of that bullet so it doesn't slow it down as it enters and penetrates into the gel. So the location of where that interlock ring is on the inside of the bullet, and then on the outside, we squeeze it with a cantilever groove, creates a very strategic weak point right there. So the bullet opens up and expands on glass. When it gets to the cantilever groove and the interlock location, that material breaks off of the bullet, and then you're left with a solid mass, that interlock ring trapping the lead core in, and you get that beautiful uniform penetration into the gel. That had to take, yeah, months and months of back and forth and adjustments. Yeah. Because yeah, as soon as you can get glass, okay, then now uh, did that create problems through drywall? Did that create problems through plywood? Mm. Then you make an adjustment for that barrier, and well, you got to make sure it still works in glass. That's, so that's back and forth and back and forth. So we launched that bullet in our subsonic line of ammunition, and it did really well. And there's a lot of people requesting that bullet as a reloading component. So shortly after that, we released it as a reloading component, and Shortly, well, actually right around that time frame, one Miles Neville officially joined us here at Hornady as a project engineer. So, Miles, you came on board, was that 2019? Yeah, yeah, May of 2019. So, you came on board, the Sub-X was one bullet, the 30 cal 190 grain bullet, and it was doing well, wildly popular, had plenty of law enforcement military application. People were were using it for hunting because, again, it does does perform. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later, but you joined us and pretty early on, you were tasked with another sub X project. Only this one was a little bit bigger, uh, not in terms of importance, but in terms of physical size of the bullets. <laughs> so yeah. let's talk about how that went down. Uh, yeah. So they came to me one day and, uh, were like, Hey, we're going to make some new subsonic expanding bullets. And I was like, okay, cool, sweet. And then they're like, yeah, it's for 3030 and 4570. And we all just kind of yeah. looked around and, and 450 Bushmaster. Yeah. And 450 Bushmaster. Like what, what are we, you know, but then you get to thinking about it and there's actually some strategic reasons why you would do that. Um, we had, like the th- the lever action stuff and the bolt action guns, there's no action to cycle. So a whole criterion, just uh, like a big one drops away where w- with the blackout, you know, you have to make the gun run mm-hmm. with a lever action or a bolt action. There's, there's no requirement there. It's going to go, it has to make it out the barrel. That's basically it and mm-hmm. be subsonic. Um, so made that part easy. Um, and then, yeah, they're, the other side of it really is that they're low recoil, uh, low muzzle blast, even if you're not running a suppressor. Uh, and then if you are running a suppressor, it's incredibly quiet. Um, but yeah, this is just a, a fun little project to get, get some more, more options for their lever gun guys. Yeah. So the, the first one was probably the 3030 or I believe what? so. Yeah. 175 grain, 3030. Yep. And so that one seems probably at least a little bit easier because all of the work that Ryan and, and Jaden and his team did to develop the 190, probably similar to do a 30 cal 175. Right, right. Yeah. And that's what, yeah, a lot of times I stand on other people's shoulders and steal their ideas and, and, you know, you just 
take what works here, what works here, and, and combine it. And there's still a little bit of fine tuning, but yeah, luckily all the the hard groundwork was already done for that yep. one. Um, but yeah, and then just make it something. And and there the problem that we faced was I think it's a one in twelve twist rate in a thirty thirty of the Sammy spec. So you have to you're limited on how big you can make the bullet, and that's why it's a one seventy five instead of a okay. one ninety. That um, makes sense because yeah, it obviously has to be stable. And yep. thirty thirty, I mean, one of the most prolific cartridges out there. I mean, if you're an American hunter, there's a good chance you have or have had or in your family, several people have a thirty thirty. Mm-hmm. It's just one of those kind of staple cartridges that's always going to be around and always has been, and so that really does lend itself to a big group of shooters. And then from there, you stepped up to from thirty thirty to forty five seventy. Now yep. that's a four hundred and ten grain bullet. This thing is a monster bullet. What kind of design hurdles uh, and and performance hurdles did you have to jump over to get something this big to obviously run through the press, shoot accurately, shoot from the firearms, and then obviously expand at the subsonic velocities. What went into a bullet that big? Yeah, so you're starting off with a really big, thick cup. Um, the actual material that we're drawing up to form the jacket, is it starts off fairly thick. And that it just once you get to that size of bullet, you need a big cup. And so we're thinning that down a lot. And we have a lot of issues early on with even getting the, the jacket to draw as long as we needed it to mm. uh, without ripping off or breaking or, you know, doing something goofy in the, in, in the press. Um, so you got that, but it's still got the same features. It's got an interlock ring down in the bottom, still got a cantaloupe. Uh, and then, yeah, it was, we, we basically took the ogive off of something like a very similar to a 45 ACP because those are already like our critical, our critical, uh, duty. Mm. is already running subsonic speeds. It's, okay. it's in the same velocity window. So that same ogive geometry is there. Um, and then on that one, <laughs> I used just the, the same tip that's in that critical duty bullet. Oh, perfect. Um, but I was playing around with that one day and I ripped it, pulled the tip out with a pair of needle nose pliers and then chucked a couple of them up in a lathe and drilled, drilled the hole deeper and under the, you know, so there's a shelf for the tip to sit on and then there's a, a, a hole even further down in there. And uh, took those into the lab, and like it doubled the the expansion diameter on those. Um, and so that was just an, again one of those things where you're goofing around, trying something else, you know, see what happens when we poke this hole deeper. Mm-hmm. And so now, and then we yeah incorporated that into the production, the core seat punch that forms that cavity has a has a little post on the bottom of it that yeah so now there's create, a bigger cavity creates that cavity down there and that, yeah that just aids with the expansion with these yeah when you're going so slow um you got to do everything you can basically to help it along and it's mm-hmm. anything that you can to weaken things to get it to open up yeah play open well that 4570 i everything i just said about the 3030 being prolific and everybody's got one that's been around forever and it's going to continue to be around all of those things are true now for the 4570 um those are yeah such a a popular cartridge and there's a lot of nostalgia around it and for good reason and let's just be honest it's a handful i mean shooting 4570 full house lows like our lever evolution it's a handful yeah um and it's it's definitely a thumper of a cartridge so now you have an option to introduce either a new shooter to the firearm or a recoil sensitive shooter uh, or anybody that just wants to enjoy an overall better shooting experience. It's quiet, way low recoil, uh, and the bullet's still built to, to, to perform terminally. Mm-hmm. And then the last introduction on the line, as far as the initial part goes, was the 450 Bushmaster. Now, we all joke internally about the 450 Bushmaster, but the reality is there is a huge part of the country east of where we live that this cartridge is incredibly viable and incredibly useful and has wide popularity. You know, it's not super applicable for a lot of us uh, in the prairie and, and in the West, but uh, yeah, in, in the, the states where there's cartridge restrictions uh, or you're hunting in dense woods, I mean, this thing is just a big hammer. And again, even in a gas gun, a 450 Bushmaster lets you know you pulled the trigger when you're shooting right. full house stuff. So mm-hmm. this one, what's the, is it a 395 grain? Yeah. Yep. That is a huge bullet. Now, when you look at cartridge size case size these bullets are huge not just obviously in diameter but the 
part of the bullet that sticks into the case is much longer than the part that actually sticks out of the case. What's the what's the implications of that in regard to factory ammunition? Obviously, you're chewing up a bunch of powder capacity. What kind of uh, what what does that create from a uh, internal ballistic standpoint? Yeah, you're you're fighting getting enough well a lot of okay so a lot of those cartridges are designed to be supersonic from the get-go mm-hmm. 30 30 45 70 all those are they're looking to get as much velocity performance as they possibly could when they design those um and so with a subsonic you're in a you're in a narrow range of cartridges that can do both supersonic and subsonic and there's limitations to the powder choices that you can use to get subsonic if you get too much volume in there and you don't have a poor case fill, like a low percentage case fill, then you run the risk of sticking bullets in the yeah. bore. Because, or getting a pressure spike on the... Right, yeah, right. Yeah, there's you, you no run, gray area. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It gets very spicy one way or the other. You mm-hmm. wear, yeah, either it, it's rangy. It doesn't doesn't want to generate any pressure or it, yeah, spikes and... Generates all the pressure. Yeah, and damages things. Um, so, and then there's a, a real narrow selection of powders that you can use that fit those volumes so yeah what you're looking to do usually uh, in something that's been designed to run supersonic is fill as much of that case capacity up with bullet as you possibly can Mm. um you've got most of the time these subsonic loads are running well under sammy pressure if they're stable um and so you're not so much worried about robbing case capacity and increasing pressures because you're not anywhere close to the ceiling you're you're trying to Rob yeah. capacity to make the case fill percentage yeah. better. So and that, you're probably trying to rob capacity to increase the pressure. Right. Because, uh, you, you know, you want yeah. it to run You want somewhere. it to obturate the case and seal seal mm-hmm. the case in the chamber. Yeah. Because that's, that's, I guess, that leak where the gas flows around the, the mouth of the cartridge case is where you lose pressure and stick bullets and get gas in your face and yeah. all that mess. Yeah. No, no good stuff there. And so while we're on that topic... Hornady has an entire line of subsonic ammunition. Uh, again, those cartridges we spoke about, uh, also the you know 300 blackout, and we have not commercially available repellent that we get to use. And uh, you know we work with a lot of uh, the manufacturers in the industry, and there's a, a very specific powder that just works really well. It's in- incredibly fluffy, for yep. lack of a better term. Yep. Um, but uh, it fills the case volume, but doesn't create a, a unsafe pressure scenario, and it actually burns pretty consistently. So you end up with uh, a pretty consistent terminal, or excuse me, internal ballistics, and you get balanced pressure, good velocities. And what velocity do we actually launch most of these loads out of the muzzle at? Uh, you're aiming for 1050. Okay. That's usually, yeah. So Mach 1, speed of sound, is rule of thumb, is 1050 plus the temperature of the day in Fahrenheit. Okay. And so, yeah, the the warmer the day is, the more spread out those air molecules are, the harder they are to compress to the point that they can't get out of the way fast enough. So the warmer it is, the, the higher the velocity wow. you can go before you break the speed of sound and get that crack. Okay. The supersonic boom on the nose of the bullet. Um. So yeah, most of the time we we try to load them, yeah, thousand to ten fifty in that ballpark. Okay, that's you're getting the most out of out of it that you can without risking going supersonic. Yep. And one thing that I found fascinating in playing with the subsonic line of ammunition and the propellant that we use specifically is if you're shooting an eight inch barrel or an eighteen inch barrel, your muzzle velocity is the same. That that to me is is kind of uh, counterintuitive, but I suppose the powder being as fluffy as it is, not quite as energy dense. You're just not, you're, the gas volume that you're producing isn't such that you're going to increase velocity with the increase in, in barrel length. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so that's interesting whether you're shooting, yeah, 18 inch carbine, 24 inch rifle, or a 16 inch, you know, short carbine, your velocity is going to be pretty stable of what's listed on the box. Pretty close. Now, that, that line of ammo that we launched with those lever action cartridges with the Bushmaster, with the 300 Blackout, just amazingly popular. Uh, because of their, their hunting application, obviously they're fun to shoot just because it's quiet and there's no recoil and that, and that makes for a better shooting experience, but these things actually perform on game. So, uh, obviously we designed it initially, Ryan, to go through the, the FBI protocol for penetration. Now on the bigger bullet side that miles had a hand in designing, 
we're not shooting for the FBI protocol. We're shooting for uh, to lay down a four-legged animal uh, on, on in a hunting situation. So what do these things do from a terminal performance standpoint? Obviously, we're not trying to get through plywood. We're not getting through wallboard. So we didn't design them to do that. But from a terminal performance standpoint, what are we seeing for expansion, penetration, and what are the effective ranges of these bullets? Well, <clears throat> on the expansion side, we're aiming for large frontal area. A caliber lot, and a half at minimum? Lot, minimum, yeah. A lot of times double, 2.3 times wow. caliber. And when you're talking you got, a 45 caliber bullet, that's That's it. what, like Miles was saying, when you're putting such a deep cavity in there and you got so much lead flow covering that jacket, and it's, it's devastating, to say the least there. I mean, you get significant temporary cavity, mm -hmm. um, a lot of penetration, and then you got, I mean, up to a 410 grain bullet, you're going to have more penetration than, say, the lighter 190 grain bullet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in, in game animals, you're getting deep wound cavities. You're not getting so much explosive. It's not going to be like a VMAX. You're not. Yeah, it's not going to come apart. It's not coming apart for sure. Heavy jackets in the base, interlocks. We want weight retention, deep penetration, and solid wound cavities. Yeah, and then having seen these things shot through gel and through animals in, in a gelatin where you can actually measure where a bullet comes to rest. I mean, these things are 16 to 20 inches of penetration. If not usually, more. If yeah, not the, more. The heavy ones go... A while. Yeah, like 30 yeah. inches. Mm -hmm. And the heavy ones, I mean, the frontal diameter on an expanded bullet at two and a half times caliber is like a 50 cent piece. And and from a terminal performance discussion, I you hear a lot of people hung up on energy. Energy this and energy that, and you've got to have this much energy to kill something and whatever. And that's been the tried and true, you know, kind of myth that people have held on to. And that's fine. And uh, ultimately, velocity is what makes a bullet work. Well, now we're at subsonic velocity. We don't have a lot, lot of velocity either, but these bullets are still killing incredibly well. Like you said, it's it's the the transfer of energy is there. You get that temporary wound cavity. Whatever velocity and energy it has, when the bullet expands, it transfers that energy into the animal, and you get wound cavities that are incredibly dramatic, all things considered, when you're looking at the velocity of the bullet uh, because they're expanding. And that's, that's the key, is that the bullet is dependent on velocity to expand, and these were purposefully designed to expand in this certain velocity window. And uh, so if anybody out there that's thinking about using them for hunting but is apprehensive, uh, rest assured, we laid down many animals in the design of this bullet system, and they are effective and they do work. From a range standpoint, again, range tied to velocity, where do you see these things start to not expand? Not expand uh, quite a, further than you're going to be able, yeah. Further than, you're, than you should be shooting the, subsonic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The good thing is you're losing velocity slow, so much slower than. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, I think on that 190, I think you're losing like 50 feet a second at 400 yards or something. It's. Oh, wow. Now like, not, let's, let's dive into that. So you're launched at 1050 feet per second from the muzzle, but you're not losing very much. Why is that? Uh, so if you look at the force of drag equation, it's uh, the velocity term in that equation is squared, basically. So the faster you go, the more drag. Even if your coefficient of drag is very low, the faster you go, your velocity term is squared. So same thing with like how energy is. Energy's, in the energy equation, velocity is squared. So the faster you go, you get dramatically more energy, right? Same thing with drag. You get So, so if you start off at 4,000 foot per second, by the time you're 100 yards downrange, you're like 3,000 foot per second. Mm -hmm. You know, you just shed that energy incredibly quickly. Uh, when you start off subsonic, you for one, your coefficient of drag drops dramatically once you break below the speed of sound. And then for two, your velocity value is half or a third of what it would otherwise be. Uh, and, and then it's squared, right? So then you lose the square of that difference. Mm -hmm. So... So you just, you're, you're the, the, facing the dra less drag. Incredibly less drag once you break subsonic, yeah. Okay, so now they're carrying way out there and they're barely losing any velocity. So right. for, the, for the layman and for myself, basically these things will expand about as far as you should be accurately shooting yeah. a subsonic. Yeah, and that's the limiting factor, I think, for, 
practical purposes, it's just how much that bullet is dropping downrange. Yeah, because at 300 yards, this thing sinks like a stone. Yeah, yeah. 150 yards. Yeah. It's on its way. Yeah, down. on its way down. Yeah. So I would say practically, like most of these, if you zero at 75 yards or so, you're mm -hmm. good from zero to 100, 120, depending on, you know, sight over whatever. And yep. your certain size of your target, whatever. Um, definitely worth, if you think you want to poke past 100, you should go to the range and play around with that and yeah. see what, what it's going to do. But for the large, uh, large majority of, of folks that hunt in heavily wooded right. areas, I mean, you're talking. That's, yeah. When I lived in Virginia, I don't yards. think, yeah. When I lived in Virginia, I don't think I ever took a shot past 70 yards. Yeah. And, and these things will, will thump when they get there. Yeah. And that, that's something I'm, I've been trying to stress to, to folks that I talked to since we've released it was that it seems counterintuitive that this bullet is going to be really effective on game. But you need to see it to believe it because it is really effective on game. Mm -hmm. On deer sized game, pigs, it is. No, there's few things funner in life than hunting pigs in Texas with thermal and or night vision. I mean, it, it doesn't get a whole lot better than that. The only way to take that to 11, subsonic with a suppressor. Right. And, and now with uh, the bullet like the Sub X, you're not just poking a hole in something and getting the fun of shooting Sub X. Now you're getting a bullet that performs and will penetrate and break through bone if necessary. Uh, it's really yep. remarkable. Yep. Yeah, that's that's the big difference because I, I know a lot of people would take 300 blackout like oh I want the heaviest bullet I can get. I have had friends you know that have come up to me and talked to me and like yeah I shot them with the you know this super heavy bullet and it just the animal didn't really seem to you know like it didn't react the way I thought it should. And I asked him what he was using. It was some sort of bow tail hollow point match bullet, like a super heavy mm -hmm. bow tail hollow point match bullet. And it's like well yeah you're getting no terminal expansion from that. Like you gotta yeah. Yeah, have having, having a bullet that fits the application is is key. Yeah, well, and that spans not just subsonic, but pretty much everything. Is you yeah. have to pick your bullet for exactly the intended purpose, and there are different bullets for different purposes. And uh, this is this is one of them that has a very specific purpose: reduced velocity expansion. And not to mention, these things shoot incredibly accurate. Right. That's one thing doing the the three hundred blackout with the FBI in mind uh, or the uh, the law enforcement at large, these things have to be accurate. And when you make a bullet like we do in our cup and core draw process, you just end up with accurate bullets. There's no way around it. Mm -hmm. Everything is concentric and true. And uh, the accuracy has been impressive as well. Oh, yeah. So from a hunting standpoint, one thing I feel like we should touch on is we, we mentioned choose the right bullet for your intended purpose. Also do some homework because yep. there are some states that have, without being condescending, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the word convoluted uh, requirements for for energy and bullet diameter and such. Uh, Nebraska is one such state. We're here in this state, and there are some nuance. Uh, there is some nuance rather to what is legal and what's not legal. For example, the 300 blackout, like like we have on the table here. Yeah. <clears throat> so what's the requirement for for us? Yeah, here in the state of Nebraska, we have a for rifle hunting deer and antelope, you have to have 900 foot pounds of energy at 100 yards, mm -hmm. which the R300 Blackout Sub X does not does not meet that requirement. However, it's more than capable and more than sufficient to kill a deer size animal at that mm -hmm. range quickly, too. Quickly, Eth ethically, yeah. ethically. And on the other hand, you got I have my notes here for the actual Game and Parks regulations for the state of Nebraska. And 357 Magnum and 45 Colt are legal re regardless of what bullet you're using. So, the uh, my opinion, that's an antiquated grandfathered in cartridges mm -hmm. that, I mean, our 357 Mag 140 FTX load has 400 foot-pounds energy at 100 yards. Yeah. But it's legal. So, I mean, that's less than half than less than half of the legally required 900 foot-pounds, but it's legal yep. just because it's 357 Mag. Yep. Where our... 300 blackout has 420 foot pounds energy at 100 yards and it's going to be just as if not more effective effective terminally yeah. as that as that 140 ftx but it's illegal just because yeah, it's antiquated. the way the regulations Which are is, written yeah and well and then then to flip that on its head if you put it into a pistol pistol requirements are different so like in front yeah. of us we have you know a ar pistol and 
it's now yep. perfectly legal. Yep, pistol requirements 400, 400 foot pounds at 50 yards. And, and yeah, now we're blowing the doors off of that. Plenty, plenty <laughs> yeah. for that. So uh, we go into that, that and say all that just to explain, do your homework in your area. If you're thinking about hunting subsonic, just, yeah, do some homework on what the, the legality is because you never want to find yourself on the wrong side of that. Uh, but from a real life terminal performance side, these things are absolute money mm-hmm. and that's, that's pretty darn cool. So the ammo has been doing great. You guys did a great job with the bullet. There was enough demand and enough people calling and asking to have these bullets available as reloading components so that they can reload them at home. And we did that now at the NRA show here in Houston, Texas, 2022, we officially launched the, all of these sub X bullets as reloading components. And that ushers in a little bit of concern, perhaps, or a little bit of uh, questioning because these cartridges, like Miles mentioned, these were cartridges designed for supersonic performance. Well, now you have these huge bullets. Now, the load data, if it's not out there yet by the time this podcast launch, it is something that's coming soon. We are working on it. Um, However, these bullets don't have to be subsonic to get the enjoyment of shooting the sub X bullet because they're just as effective, if not more effective and, uh, just as fun when they're supersonic, but much reduced, you know, like miles had mentioned, the propellant technology that we use is not commercially available yet. So you can't go to the store and buy that. So you're left with what you can buy and not all cartridges lend themselves to running subsonically. So let's take, for example, a 4570, 410 grain bullet. What kind of terminal performance are we going to see at, let's say, 14 or 1500 feet per second? Is that going to be too fast for the bullet or what do we, what do we think there? No, I think uh, in testing that, I loaded it up to like a full house, as high a velocity as I could get with like a full house. 2000 feet two, per second. Yeah, two, two max pressure load and uh, the bullet holds together and it's the most devastating thing I've ever shot through gel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's disgusting. I mean, it turned a rifle gel block into a a four-legged octopus yeah just completely split it so for those listening a rifle what we consider a rifle gel block is uh, our standard gel block is 25 pounds of 10 percent 10 percent ballistic uh, gelatin what we call a rifle block is a 50 pound block of gelatin that is roughly 12 inches wide eight inches tall and 20 inches deep i don't know i think they're a little more than that 22 22 inches deep yeah it's a big block of gel and when you shoot that thing at high velocity with say a 30-06 it does some dancing in the air but you're saying this thing obliterated oh yeah completely yep and that is like 50 cent piece expansion it's uh yeah very impressive and like i said because we start off with such a thick cup down in the bottom of that draw Mm -hmm. and with the interlock in there it, it holds together and handles handles that velocity pretty well that is great to hear and hopefully we can put some people's mind at ease that are hesitant to use this for hunting because trust us that it was specifically designed for that purpose. And although it seems counterintuitive because it does kind of contradict, you know, you need 900 foot pounds of energy if you want to kill a deer or something like that. uh, Those old antiquated thoughts make sense when you're talking about old antiquated bullet design, but this is a modern bullet design built for modern weapons at uh, at reduced velocity and that's simply amazing that you guys were able to find ways to make this work uh, and i think that's something that hornady does in spades is find ways to make things work and again it all comes back to our team of engineers with the management style of you guys are smart you guys know what the mission is now go find a way to do it and they kind of turn you loose and uh, it's got to feel I don't know, freeing to operate in that environment. I don't know uh, in jobs that you guys had previous to this, if you you can relate to otherwise, but uh, that management style seems to have worked for us. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and right now, you know, we've got an empty seat. Uh, Our senior ballistician, Jaden Quinlan, uh, was going to jump in on the conversation, but this man is a mad scientist. And, uh, you know, the last couple of years, I feel like our research and development hasn't slowed down, but our product releases have kind of slowed down just because of market conditions. But um, you guys are always t- 
jacking around with stuff <laughs> for, I think that's probably the appropriate term. Yeah. I was going to say for lack of a better term, but I think that one's probably pretty appropriate. Yeah. Uh, and in the subsonic line, you guys don't have to tell me anything that you're working on because I'm a marketeer now. You can't tell me any secrets, but I got to expect that the sub X line is going to continue to grow. I yeah. think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've worked on a few here recently. One, I'm like, I don't know if we've even launched it yet, so I'm not yeah. going to comment on it. Okay. <laughs> I thought we did, but yeah, well, there's a couple more in the works. and That's awesome. Similar yep. bullet. Yep. It just makes, yeah, there's there's a few, quite a, quite a few different calibers and cartridges out there that it's applicable for, so I'm sure. Awesome. We'll and continue to see it. I'm excited because I, I love shooting suppressed. I love shooting with shorter barrels, and it just makes life easy. Now, before we wrap this up, I want to talk about something that I know is going to get dropped in the comments here, or I know people are going to be calling in and asking because I've already fielded this question. We did like some lever action style cartridges and stuff, and that's great uh, where you can make really huge bullets because of the, the diameter of the bullets. You end up with these massive bullets that chew up all this capacity. People are going to want and do want 223, 308, 65 Creedmoor. You know, it's kind of the what I'm going to call the standard and the, and the bolt action cartridge, especially now with Creedmoor and how popular that is and the 308. What hurdles have limited us from being able to, well, one, I don't believe that we've ever set out specifically to try to crack that nut and tossed a ton of effort into it. Mm -hmm. But what are the design hurdles that, that are going to really hinder that? Because uh, like I said, I know I've been asked that question before. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got the powders that we've got. And there's still limitations with those powders. Okay. Um, and if you get a case capacity that's big enough, there's not a workaround for it. Yep. You're, yeah. If you're, you're just, small enough in diameter, you can't chew up the capacity because you right. can't make the bullet bigger because of the twist rate. Yep. And uh, yeah, you just, you end up in one gun, it works and the next gun, it doesn't. Or just overall, there's no happy spot that gives you consistent performance that, yep. that we feel good about releasing basically. Okay. Well, and that, that makes total sense because this cartridge, if you load it up, let's say a 308 Winchester, 1 in 12 twist, Sammy twist rate, you can only make that bullet so long and heavy. And if you make it work, it's got to work in the pressure and velocity barrel. It's got to work in every single gun out there ever mm -hmm. made. You, you have to be able to hang your hat on, this is going to successfully work. Right. And if it doesn't, Yep. That's that's a problem. Yeah, if you're getting 1050 in one gun and 450 in another, it gives a guy pause. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there are definitely some more hurdles to jump through, but you guys have done a great job uh, making this thing work and making this thing a successful product. So yeah, in summary, it started in 2016 uh, with some law enforcement military application in mind. The 190 sub X, 300 blackout load, the first to launch. And successfully beat the FBI protocol for penetration. Then we followed that up with some uh, bigger cartridges, some popular cartridges, especially in the eastern side of the United States, uh, that make it easy. These things will perform wonderfully when hand-loaded at a reduced velocity, whether that be 14, 15, 16, 1700 feet per second, or subsonic. They will expand because the bullet's not meeting a ton of resistance in flight. They expand much further than you'll actually be able to accurately shoot them, which is amazing because, uh, you know, that type of performance doesn't come easy, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And uh, like you mentioned, Miles, at 150 yards, like my Aunt Gladys's Thanksgiving stuffing, just sink you like a stone. And then after that, uh, we're talking propellant technology. We're limited, um, but we have what we have, and what we do have works absolutely great. So in a nutshell... That's all things sub X and subsonic. Did we miss anything? Uh, if you're reloading subsonic, start high and work down. That's counterintuitive to most reloading practices, but yeah, it's to it keep you. Like I said, when you're not pushing the limits of pressure necessarily, mm -hmm. um, then it's better to start higher, start supersonic and work your way down, okay. as opposed to sticking bullets in the bore. Yeah, that's a problem. We definitely don't want to do that. So hand loaders proceed with caution. Um, more things to come in the future i think uh like you guys had mentioned i know ryan kind of alluded to and not uh, in, in all the words that yeah we are working on some new stuff which is great to hear and uh i can't wait to see what they are because i see this line and i see this style of shooting getting nothing but more popular awesome mm -hmm. well guys i'll let you get back to the engineering laboratory and uh, start tinkering around with some more stuff 
And uh, guys, thanks for listening in on another podcast. We'll catch you guys on the next one.